Hi, how's it going? This is a webinar, and the reason that I'm not presenting this in person is because of the uh, coronavirus stuff going on. And um, as I'm rapidly learning, is uh, I kind of like presenting without the pants requirement thing. That's a pretty cool side effect that I've learned of uh, doing more things virtually is that the restrictions of pants need not apply. So if you're watching this at home, join me in the pantsless revolution. And uh, there is um, a hammock behind me. That is my hammock that I keep in my office for impromptu naps. So just so you're looking at it for the next 45 minutes or more. Um, so you know what it is. It's a very cool hammock um, and that it's very portable. So if you'd like to get one, I can send you the information on where to get one. So today I'll be talking about uh, vision and how vision is more than the 2020 visual acuity that we normally talk about. But first, I'm going to talk about the sun. So if I was to describe someone to you who took the light of the sun and bent it to their will by converging and diverging and refracting, refracting and diffracting and reflecting and anti-reflecting. You would say, wow, that person must be like a superhero, right? That they can harness this power of the sun to their will. You would say, wow, they're a superhero. So that's why I say that Opticians, we should be called light vendors, which truly captures the brilliance of what we do for the world. So this lecture, I'm going to cover a few things. Now, um, if you ever watch TED Talks, TED Talks are about 17 minutes long, and they capture some of the most important dynamics in the world today. Um, but when one is recording things for continuing education, the goals are a little bit different. So we need to take maybe three to four minutes of content and then stretch it out to 50 minutes. So to do that, I don't want to do it any more than you want to listen to it. So I'm going to take a kind of circuitous path to get there through, um, number one, we're going to talk about a couple of movies. Uh, we're going to talk about Tigger. I'm going to talk about an interview with my son, Nicholas. Um, we'll talk uh, to my daughter, talk about my daughter, Mariana. Um, we'll talk about Star. I think it's Wars, not Trek, right? Yeah, it's Wars. I've probably just lost half of you right there. Sorry. Um, then we'll talk about a few great philosophers of our time. You have uh, Sai, the Gangnam Style guy. You have Leo Tolstoy, who's a Russian author. And then Peter Drucker, who is a management consultant. And then last but not least, this last picture right here is my wife. And um, she's older now, um, but this is the only picture that she was okay with me sharing. But the main thing that I really wanted to capture that this picture captured perfectly is that face, which is a face that I... Um, it's a little embarrassing to admit, but I strive to get that face on a day-to-day -day basis just by um, being annoying. So let's talk about movies. This movie, Dogma, really weird movie, um, but it was back when like Matt Damon and Ben Affleck and all these people were super young. But um, what Dogma is, is principles or rules that cannot be questioned. So to usually it's a religious thing, but it also happens in healthcare. Um, so I'm going to just talk about a few kind of things, these unquestionable truths of yore. Um, one was called a dung compress. So back in the uh, dark ages, when the plague was all the rage, um, if you had a flesh wound, what they would do is they would press uh, dung into the wound. So any vegetarian animal would do. So if you did elephant dung was the best because that was the most plentiful, but cow dung would do the trick as well. Um, so you would press that into the wound um, to draw out the pus, which doesn't make a lot of sense now, but, you know, seven, eight hundred years ago, it was like, hey, it's working. 
Um, so since some people survived that treatment, uh, they stuck with it for a little while. Um, the other one was there was this dude, Galileo, who uh, he did some math and figured out that the universe does not revolve around the earth. So it was uh, the churches, the church was like, hey, the universe revolves around the earth. Galileo was like, here, I can prove that it doesn't. And they're like, hey, that's nice. Go to jail. So they sent him to jail until he denounced um, his his uh, his findings. Um, but these things are hundreds of years ago. Like, this stuff doesn't happen anymore, right? Well, kind of it does. So back in, uh, back in the 40s and 50s, um, there was a, a, for mental health, when you had a patient who was schizophrenic or had some kind of, um, some kind of mental malaise going on, um, they would do what's called a transorbital, uh, transorbital lobotomy. So what that was, was, um, so the orbit is like the hole in your skull where the eye is. So what they would do is they would push your eye out of the way and they would, they would actually like wedge a big nail up into your brain and wiggle it around till you weren't crazy anymore. Um, so they did about, I think, 18,000 of those over the course of seven years um, if, to, to cure mental illness. Um, so that's not cool. Um, but the, what that is to say is that this stuff still exists and is still prevalent. We just don't necessarily know it in the moment, right? So while we're living in this logical fallacy, we don't know it. But then later, we're like, how could they not know it? So I'm just going to talk about the construct of, uh, of dogmas and circular reasoning. So the conclusion is the premise. So the, the one, I, I just came across this the other day, and I was like, whoa, cool, that perfectly illustrates it. So I was, uh, I was watching Winnie the Pooh with my daughter, and uh, Tigger has this song where he says, the wonderful thing about Tiggers is Tiggers are wonderful things. Um, so... There's no actual proof that Tiggers are wonderful things here until you watch and you're like, whoa, he can bounce on his tail. Cool trick. Um, but this statement is a complete statement, but it's, it doesn't prove anything because the premise and the conclusion are one and the same. So that's circular reasoning because you could just go around in that circle infinitely and never, ne never, dis never disprove that Tiggers are wonderful things. So vision kind of has the same thing going on. And um, so we, we say 2020 is perfect vision. So if somebody has 2020 vision, their vision must be perfect. So that gets us into a bit of a problem. So have you ever seen a patient where everything looks good? So the refraction matches the glasses and the glasses fit the patient perfectly and there's still just something wrong with them? Well, according to this circular reasoning, that's not a thing, right? There's no room for that possibility anywhere. So when we're faced with that possibility, we're like, I don't know what to do, you must be crazy. This patient must be crazy. So what I'm gonna talk about is that, hey, maybe they're not crazy. Um, so how old's 2020? Like who decided that 2020 is perfect vision? This dude, Herman Snellen. So there's not a whole lot of people who can pull off a mustache, but Herman Snellen could pull off a mustache good. Um, but, but the Snellen chart was invented in 1862, and it was the first standardized method of measuring vision. So what that created is a situation where what one doctor measures somewhere is compatible with what another doctor measures elsewhere. So that's a really cool thing because it actually creates standardization in medicine versus everybody making up their own rules. That was super neat, um, but it was also 150 some years ago, right? So maybe maybe like there's more that we can do now, right? Um, and what that, what that 2020 represented is visual acuity, which is the clarity of your vision. So I'm gonna be talking more about different parts of vision other than the clarity component. So how much vision do we have? So when we look at the world, how much vision do we have? This chart represents 180 degrees. So what that is, is 180 degrees, is you have two individual eyes. So each individual eye has about 150 degrees, about 60 degrees to the nasal and about 90 degrees to the temporal. And together, 
they have about 120 degrees in the middle. So that 120 degrees is your binocular visual field, is, is, your, is your binocular vision. So that 120 degrees can be seen with both eyes. But overall, between your two eyes, you have about 180 degrees, which means that's about half of a circle. And then you're up top, you can see about 60, and down below, you can see about 75. So that's how, that's how much visual awareness you have. So if you had to guess how much of this 180 degrees is the perfect part, how much is it? Like, because if I go like this and look at the camera, I can't. I can't see it clearly. Like if I'm looking over here and seeing the camera in my peripheral vision, I can't see it clearly. Like I can't see it with good acuity. So clearly out here in my vision is not 20-20 vision. But how much of our 180 degrees of vision is 20-20? About one to two degrees. So that one to two degrees is the area of your retina called the fovea or the macula. And that is the perfect vision area of your vision. So that's not much, right? So we have 180 degrees and one to two degrees is the perfect part. So just for some context, here's a perfect image of arguably the most beautiful fountain in the world. And then um, when, I was, when I was in my mid twenties, I read a book by Leo Tolstoy called The Death of Ivan Ilyich. And that book, completely changed my outlook on my life and just it, it changed everything for me. Um, so I, th I think so I'm going to share an excerpt from that book with you. That's just perfect. So that's not particularly useful. So the perfect part kind of sucks. So what is the acuity within this field? We have 180 degrees. How what do we do with the rest of it? So we have the one to two degrees, that's the middle, and then we have, you know, a whole lot more. What does that stuff do? This is the imperfect part. So what you can see is that the acuity degrades rapidly. So this is 20-20 visual acuity at the fovea. And then as you get a certain number of degrees away from the fovea, pardon this thing that pops up in the middle, um, but as you get a certain number of degrees away from your fovea, your visual acuity drops very quickly. So when you get about 10 degrees from the fovea, you're already at a fraction of your visual acuity. So what does the imperfect part do, though? So basically what it provides is context. So the peripheral vision is very sensitive to motion and is very sensitive to things happening. So what that does is essentially guides your clear vision to go places and pick things up. So what you do is your eye doesn't take a picture like a snapshot. Your eye takes miniature high definition, like where it's high definition in the middle and then slowly worse, and then it, it moves your eyes around. You move your eyes around to actually build the picture in your head. So this is a lot more efficient than taking snapshots. So if we just took high definition snapshots of the entire world around us, our head would need to be this big to hold all the information that we're passing back to the visual cortex. So, so the way we build the picture is with saccades and fixation. So what we do is we move our eyes around to the interesting parts of a scene and build the picture in our head from that. So let's talk a little bit about how 2020 vision is like tying shoes. And for that, um, we'll ask, we'll talk to my son, Nicholas. So my son, Nicholas came into me, um, in case you can't tell his, uh, he's going to be running for president someday. And I think we should remove the age limit because he's going to be a vast improvement over the status quo. Um, so the one day Nick runs up to me and says, Dad, I know how to tie my shoes. I'm like, dude, that's great. And uh, about 20, 30 minutes later, I'm like, yo, Nick, back up. We're, we're getting ready to go. He's like, Dad, can you tie my shoes? I'm like, wait, you just, you just said you know how to tie your shoes. That indicates to me that you're capable of tying shoes. He says, well, I can only tie my shoes if the laces are prepared in a certain way. I'm like, well, then you don't know how to tie your shoes. I said, yes, I do. Well, then tie your shoes. I can't. 
So this debate went on way longer than I would care to admit. And what Nick and I were able to eventually come to a consensus on was that he knows how to tie his shoes in a special set of circumstances. So 2020 is kind of like that. It's perfect vision in a special set of circumstances. So the patient is sitting still, fully supported. The image that they're looking at is still. They are still. Um, the patient isn't moving and they're looking straight ahead. So how often in life do you encounter this perfect special set of circumstances where your acuity is spot on? Well, some, but usually not like the most pleasant places that you want to be in life. So an airplane is a pretty good simulation of that, as is the dentist, EMV, as a defendant at court. And then if that doesn't go real well, the kind of best simulation is this, which is an electric chair. So these are the times in your life where you may encounter the special set of circumstances that helps. So what's our goal when we do a refraction? So the goal of a refraction is, okay, hey, we're trying to get the light from wherever it is to the fovea, right? So if, we, if it focuses past the fovea, we want to use plus to get it to the fovea. If it's, if it's before the fovea, we want to use minus to get it to the fovea. So essentially what that does is takes this perfect image, broadcasts it to the fovea, and just assumes that because the visual cortex, which is the very back of the brain, can see it, we're done. But that's not the whole story, right? So this goes back. So the information that's shot onto this movie screen that is the retina goes all the way to the back of the brain and where it's processed in the visual cortex. That's actually the back of your brain. So there's a lot of stuff going on between here and there, right? Like that's safe to say that the brain's a fairly complex organism that there's a lot of stuff going on. So vision is a little bit more than 2020. So I'm gonna go through the development of vision from birth. Uh, this is super duper cliff notes, um, but I'm gonna just take you through my daughter. So this is Mariana, and um, the cool thing about my wife is she take a, takes a picture of our daughter every single day um, that she's alive, except this one. I took this one because my wife had had a busy day and she was kind of laid up. Um, but if I ever need like a picture from the 100, 179th day of her life, it's available. So when a baby's first born, their vision is monochromatic. They can't see color. Uh, their acuity is approximately 2400 and they can't see behind eight to beyond eight to ten inches and honestly in that time of their life they don't really need to see beyond eight ten ten inches because all they're looking for is um, some food source and they'll only hold their gaze for a few seconds because hey everything's blurry and uninteresting but things develop pretty rapidly so by week four um, they'll start moving their head towards a light source. They'll start tracking objects horizontally by moving their head and they'll start making brief eye contact. That's still pretty boring. Um, but then kids get progressively cooler. So around two to three months, that's when they start recognizing faces. Um, that's when they start studying their hands and their feet, which to me is the single coolest thing to watch a baby do um, because it's like they're studying these little alien hands and feet. Uh, they'll also start tracking objects circularly and vertically. That's a good time to get like a mobile to, for them to be entertained by. And they'll also recognize faces a second time because I didn't bother to uh, modify this particular slide after presenting this 30 to 40 times. I should probably get on that one day. Now from three to six months, um, things get more complex. So they start widening out and preparing themselves to uh, enter the world. So they start, you know, looking across the room. They like looking at their reflection and they'll start moving their eyes independently from their head. Now, the important thing to note, which is why it's in bold, which I think is why bold was invented, is that perfect acuity is achieved around month six of life. Now, perfect acuity, I consider, I compare that to the force from Star Wars. Like when Luke first figured out that he could do forcey stuff. 
Um, he wasn't very good at it. He had it, but he wasn't really good at channeling the force. Um, but this is Mariana at six months, so I like to consider it like, okay, at that point, when, when they have perfect acuity, that's, they have the force. Now, from a traditional optometric and refraction component, we're like, okay, hey, 2020, done. We're good. But are we, like, if I went into my physician for my once every 10 to 12 years physical and said, hey, um, doc, uh, I feel all right. And then the doctor might ask me questions like, hey, um, are you starting to get any teeth in? I said, nah, well, yeah, man, I've had teeth for a while. Um, and then they might ask questions like, how's your grip strength? Like, can you grab my finger? How is that? Um, so, and they'll be like, Hey, are you getting ready for solid foods? Um, so if my doctor assessed me to a six month standard for my physical, I would probably find a new doctor cause that sounds preposterous, right? But that's kind of what we're doing with vision is we're assessing a patient essentially to a six month standard of visual, um, visual development. But what happens after six months? So after six months, you have the force, and now you start like figuring out how to use the force. So what's using the force like? So you can integrate sight with sound. So when you hear something, you turn your eyes and you look at it. You can integrate your sight with motor. I can look over here and reach over here and know where I'm reaching. So there's a local component where you can see what's going on. Um, also, balance is an incredibly important component. Um, a vision is an incredibly important component of vision. This is why you shouldn't record webinars at 11 o'clock at night. Okay, vision is an essential component of balance. There we go. Okay. And if you want to test that balance thing, um, stand on one leg and close your eyes and see how long that lasts. So, past six months, we're mastering the force. And that kind of goes in a progression that you start with, you know, crawling, self-feeding, and peekaboo, and then you start walking and doing, um, inspecting things close up, um, and then you go to, you know, drawing, reading, writing, that kind of stuff, and then, then you get, when you get really good, then you can do music and sports and things where your body and your vision are very heavily integrated. So all of those things happen after you achieve 2020 vision. So how do we measure that? So every now and then I find a slide and I'm like, why is this slide here? That's what this slide is. Um, but this is just kind of like a cool, did you know thing about the vision? So you know that the brain um, it, this is like, I think some fourth grade brain, fourth grade brain learning is your left brain controls your right body. So like right now my right arm is moving and my left brain is doing that. So my right brain controls my left arm. Now the vision, if the vision worked like that, what we could do is we could move our eyes independently, which would be really freaking creepy, right? Um, so to avoid us being super creepy though, I guess if we were all creepy, that would be fine, but whatever. So rather than the right brain controlling the left eye, the right brain controls the left side of the vision in each eye. And then the left brain controls the right side of the vision in each eye. So that's just kind of a cool whoop de doo Let me go a little bit more into the brain. So when we look at these paths, so you have the retina here, and then it travels down the optic nerve. And then this just kind of looks like, okay, hey, this is like two lanes merging into a super highway that goes back to the visual cortex, right? And same thing happens here. It's retina, super highway, merge the two eyes, go through the super highway, go back to the visual cortex to be processed. Um, so that's not really how it works because about one third of the information that comes in through the retina gets dropped off when I, when I, I'm sure that I would not be a good like neurology teacher because of the way I talk. So I, th I think of like the retina as like a, it's like a, uh, like a bunch of, a bunch of light things get on the bus 
and then they take the bus back to the visual cortex. But then some of them get off along the way. So about a third of the light stuff, I'm the worst, I apologize. About a third of the light stuff gets dropped off here, which is, this is the lateral geniculate body. The lateral geniculate body is part of the brainstem, part of like your, um, your mammalian type stuff that's also integrated in all of these other things. So your speech, your motor control, hearing, breathing, balance, sensation of pain, and circadian rhythm. You ever like watch somebody get kicked in the crotch from across the room and it makes you kind of wince? That's not necessarily a visual reaction so much as your brainstem reaction saying, oh. So with all of this stuff going on, an eye chart is not particularly sufficient to help us out in, um, in detecting, hey, how does your vision integrate with your speech? How good are you at sports? How good are you at reading? Like, we can't do a whole lot with that with just a standard eye chart. So this is where our buddy Peter Drucker comes in. So he says, this, this quote is pretty good for everything in business and life and everything. If you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So how do you measure vision in a way beyond the eye chart? Well, here is a few things. So now there's pretty cool stuff um, that tracks eye movements. So an eye movement is a very complex series of things that go on in the brain to make the eyes move around. Uh, su substantially more complex than reading a letter A while not moving. Now, eye tracking was originally designed for somewhat nefarious purposes, and those nefarious purposes was marketing. So, hey, if I can track where people's eyes are going to go, I can put higher profit margin items there. But somebody hijacked this technology for good. And now we can do cooler stuff with it. So one of the things that it can do is track the accuracy of eye movement. So one of the one of the things that um, is used for that. So this this thing is called Gazebook Dystagmus, and this is something that police officers use to assess sobriety. So when you are drunk, you have involuntary control of your eye out near the outside. So what they'll say is, "Hey, follow my light." And when you get out to a certain point, your eyes just start wobbling because they can't they can't hold. So that's called Gazebook Dystagmus. Um, the other thing that uh, eye tracking technology can do is it can track reaction speed and anticipation that something's going to go where it should go. Um, and it can track that the eyes are working together, not just straight ahead. So normally through a phoropter, we're looking like this. And then the, when they correct for prism, we're still looking like this. But what happens when I look like that? Might my prism needs change? How about like this or this? Like, um, so sometimes your eyes might react differently at different positions of gaze. So there's some other uses for eye tracking tech. Um, the one thing that's pretty cool is uh, for training athletes um, is there's a lot of stuff out there in sports vision where they're using eye tracking to improve reaction time for say a goalie in uh, a goalie in hockey or something like that. I would imagine it would come in handy in uh, competitive ping pong as well. Um, and then the other thing is uh, police officers. So what they can actually do is measure a police officer's um, state via their eyes. So if you have a situation where you have a veteran offer, officer going into a situation where they've been a hundred times before, their eyes move a certain way. Their eyes move with confidence, with knowing reactions, and they go in a way that is predictable. Now, to compare that to somebody who just got out of academy, who's in a new situation, um, their eye movements are going to be incredibly frantic. And, oh, by the way, they have a lethal weapon in their pocket. So, um, so what you can do, what they're, what they're using the technology for, is to train police officers to look for the right things and actually working with them to get them looking for the right things and actually measuring if they are going to be effective in those difficult situations. Um, the other thing that's being done, which is pretty exciting for me at Chadwick Optical, is that they're researching the effects of visual impairment on eye movement. So things like visual field loss. So earlier, um, when I showed that picture of the brain where the left side of the brain uh, controls the right side of the vision, right side of the brain controls the left side of the vision, the 
Um, so sometimes after a stroke, a patient will lose half of their vision. So they'll just only have vision from here to here instead of the entire 180. And um, the, what we can do is see how that patient or how that type of patient with that affliction will react, how their eye movements change. And it helps kind of create new, um, new solutions for them if we know how they're going to act once they've acquired this condition. The other thing that's cool is video games. So as we move into VR, um, the potential for massive gaming computers goes down a little bit because you know, you're wearing it on your head. So they're using a thing called foveated rendering where they're building the scene around where you are looking rather than building the entire scene in high definition all the time. So similar to the same thing I was talking about earlier, how your head does not take just a snapshot of everything simultaneously. Um, what this would do is build the scene just, it would have high definition in the center and then fade out the definition. So this is, um, so I've talked a lot about uh, visual acuity and then I've talked a little bit about eye tracking. So I just want to um, show you, so this is a test called um, right eye. So these are the results from a test called right eye. And what this is, I'm going to show you two patients with 20-20 vision tracking a dot going around in a circle. So this is patient one, and then this is patient two. So each of these patients has 20-20 vision, and they're tracking a dot going around in a circle. So According to a standard refraction, these two patients have the same exact visual, the, the same exact capacity for vision. They're, they're both the same. But I would venture to guess that if you encountered this person with 2050 vision versus this person with 2020 vision, who would you rather have driving your Uber? I would probably lean towards this guy um, because seriously, what's going on here? I don't know. So my biggest hope for the future of vision testing and assessment is that one day there will be a cure for husband vision. And husband vision is something that is near and dear to me. And it seems to be also um, something that my children have as well. Um, so maybe the name should not be husband vision. But what, what husband vision is, is the idea that um, something exists somewhere and that we just can't see it. We are completely blind to the existence of something. So I'm just going to tell you a little story and I'm title this, Why My Wife Should Be Sainted. So most weeks, um, pre-pandemic, so uh, now that it's during the pandemic, it is just a fest of ice cream and Oreos as because um, normally pants kind of act as this great equalizer. Like when the pants are too tight, you know, you probably should take a day of, um, of eating a little bit less. But without pants, now I have no barometer for how much I eat. So it's ice cream and everything. But I digress. So why my wife should be sainted. So back in the day before the pandemic, what we would do is each week we would put together our meal plan for the week so we could go grocery shopping. And um, we have a little notebook that we write all that down in. So uh, my wife said, hey, can you go get the pink notebook next to the fridge? I said, yes, yes, I accept your mission. I choose to accept this mission. So I went off in search of a pink notebook next to a fridge which looks exactly like this. I did not see it there. It was not there. And I knew because this, this was not the first time this happened. I knew that it must be there. So I really tried. So I looked on this side and then I was clever. I didn't just give up on this side of the fridge. I looked on the other side of the fridge too. So I looked on the other side of the fridge. It wasn't there either. So, I just looked and looked. So I probably spent four or five minutes looking for this pink notebook next to a fridge. And so just uh, given context, so this is my kitchen and then my wife would be kind of back over here, um, maybe like 10 feet away. 
So I'm sure she was watching me struggle with this, kind of chuckling. And after the five minutes, I came back to her and sheepishly said, Then I cannot find the pink notebook. That's for sure. To which she turned and pointed to an alternate interpretation of a pink no notebook next to a fridge which is this with it standing upright next to the fridge with things in front of it. So I got the look. So the reason I'm talking about this, about the limitations of visual acuity, is that opticianry is in a unique place um, where a lot of people get their refractions simply so they can go online and buy a pair of glasses. Um, so the future of opticianry is at this point, we have iPhones able to do refractions. I mean, I, the, one, the one company that did it, I think, went out of business for just lawsuits and everything. But I mean, that technology is going to be here. Um, you can measure your PD with it pretty well, um, probably as accurate as somebody with a PD stick. And it can also show you how a frame looks on your face. There's That technology is getting better and better. The newer iPhones can actually do a 3D scan of your face. Um, so all of these things that we traditionally rely on are stuff that we need to look at and reconsider potentially. So with that not being the future, so with, with the patients moving a lot to the internet, with the patients being able to do virtual try-ons, um, which, I mean, especially with the pandemic thing, okay, now it's like, okay, maybe I don't want to go try on frames that other people have tried on, right? Um, so so this, this kind of future of opticianry is a little bit bleak in a lot of ways. But the one thing is that this patient, this guy who you would not want to be your Uber driver, is absolutely a patient that you want. Because this is somebody who is going to be hypersensitive. So if they get one of those pairs of glasses that has yoked prism built into it because the PDs were made off or, you know, OCs mismatch or, or just anything, they're going to be hypersensitive to a bad pair of glasses. And this is your patient of the future. And roughly, I think uh, it's about 25% of the people in this country have uh, experienced the TBI. Um, so there's there's a massive number of people who have this going on, and uh, it's important to be aware of that and to just be cognizant of it for the future, for your future. That concludes my spiel. Um, if you like nerding out on lenses, um, so normally I go home and I talk to my kids and I talk to my wife and they are over it. Um, so if you ever want to nerd out, um, please, please. This is me begging you. Please call me. Please email me. Any questions you have, I would love to talk to you about glasses and vision and all of the stuff that fascinates me. Thank you. Ciao.